Hey and welcome back. Robert Breaker here. Uh, today's message is going to be on biblical numerics. This is a message I've been wanting to preach now for a while and um, it's it's something that's really not that spectacular. Um, a lot of people say, man, I'm enjoying your, your messages. They're, they're just wonderful. And it's like, well, okay, this one won't be that wonderful. Uh, this is more of a teaching message. But in the Bible, numbers have meanings. And as we go through the Bible and we look at different numbers, we find this recurring theme over and over. Well, this number's connected with this, and this number's connected with this, and this number, oh, it's connected with this. So there's a lot that I'd like to say today. Um, don't know how this is going to go, but this I just believe that this is something I need to teach on, as this will be something I'll be referring to later on in the coming messages that come. I believe it was last week I preached on Bible patterns, and I showed different patterns in the Bible and um, how God is a God of, wow, just this amazing God, a mathematician. God is a great uh, mathematical genius, and one of the things God does is He uses numbers, and He uses codes. And uh, so there's some people that believe there are different codes in the Bible that can be found through numbers. Uh, we looked at this book here last time, The Mathematical Perfection of the King James Bible by Periander Esplana, and uh, how God is just a mathematical genius and how God uses numbers. Well, today we're going to look at numbers. Uh, some people might call this teaching gematria. I don't like that term gematria, but I guess that's the word that they use when, when uh, numbers have meanings. But I'm not going to use that term. Uh, Clarence Larkin uses the term scripture numerics, and he has a chapter toward the end of his book, on the greatest book on dispensational teaching all the world, scriptural numerics, and he talks a little bit about this as well. If you go to Bible school, they teach this kind of stuff. And why am I teaching this? Well, like I said, it's going to be something that I'll refer back to in future messages. But also, it's it's just fun to know. Okay, this is what this this number means in the Bible, and it's interesting to see how God is just so amazing how He uses numbers. Clarence Larkin calls him the great geometrician. <laughs> Geometria, geometria. How he uses numbers. So we're going to go through this, going to look at this. I don't think this is going to be very long, if you will. This isn't going to be the longest message that I've ever preached. But it will be beneficial in the future as we look at new messages I can point back to this one. Now, <clears throat> one thing I want to say, uh, kind of uh, off the cuff here, I guess, I had a guy send me some of these Bible code things, and it's just amazing. It's amazing. Not only does God use the different numbers, but how God uses the Bible code. He sent me a couple of things. Maybe I'll put one up here, and, and you can see it. But he went to Isaiah chapter 53. One of the greatest prophecies in the Old Testament of Jesus Christ and his sufferings on the cross. And guess what? You type in Messiah or whatever, and it's just amazing how you see all around Isaiah 53... Well, there he is. There's Jesus Christ. He's mentioned. So if you look at the Bible code, you can't help but see that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. But also, one of the things he said was every 20th letter. So again, numbers. And then that spells out Messiah or Jesus. So this is a little different than the Bible code. This is more like a numbers code. But it's basically teaching that every number has a meaning behind it. Now, I don't know all the numbers. I'm just going to go through the basic ones and try to give you scripture to prove this as well. And I don't really have that many Bible verses to go to today. I just want to briefly put up here what are the different numbers, what do they mean. So let's start with, well let me go ahead and start with one verse because I want to read a Bible verse at least. Psalm 71 and verse 15. David says in Psalm 71, 15, My mouth shall show forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the numbers thereof. What an odd thing for a man to say. To say, my mouth will, will speak about your righteousness and your salvation all day long, because I don't know what your numbers are of there. <laughs> oh, what, is, what is he saying? There's some numbers involved with righteousness, some numbers involved with salvation. I don't understand that verse, but I was looking in my Bible verses about numbers and how many times the word number shows up and how many times the word number shows up. It was just interesting. that David said, there's some things that I don't know, and some of the things I don't know about are the numbers. Well, what I want today to do is teach on scriptural numerics 
or biblical numerics. We're going to look at different numbers and what they mean. So first of all, we'll go with one. And go, let me go ahead and just write them up here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. We can still go down. Put twelve down here. We have room for thirteen. We do. And that's about as far as I'm going to go. Is number thirteen. Then over here, I might put a. Um, 14, I might put uh, 40 or some other numbers, but we'll see as we go along. Well, first of all, the number 1, as you would probably assume, is the number of unity, or a unit. Just one unit. It symbolizes the unity of God. In um, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, we have seven distinct ones in the Bible. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. So one is the number of unity or a unit of one thing. That's simple. I mean, okay, that's pretty basic. Like I said, didn't you teach this? They teach this in Bible school, and some of it's redundant. But then some of this hopefully will be a blessing and something that you will learn. Two is the number of union. Two is two things coming together as one, such as the union of marriage. Two shall be called one flesh. The union of Christ and the church. The reunion of the two natures of Jesus. Um, many things here. I'm, I'm looking at Larkin's thing here. And how he gives these different numbers. And it's like, uh, is, is what he has here um, good enough to explain? Or, or something like that. But this is interesting. He has some interesting things here. So one and two are the simple basic ones. Now when we come to the number three... Three is the number of divinity or trinity. And when we get to this number, I think it's important that we understand something. I've had some people emailing lately that say, I don't believe in the trinity. And I think, well, why? why? Why would you say such a silly thing, I don't believe in the trinity, when it's all through the Bible? As a matter of fact, it's in the very first verse of the Bible. How can you miss out on the Trinity and say, I don't believe that God is a Trinity? Well, then, are you reading your Bible even at all? In Genesis chapter 1, in verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2 says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. Now, you continue reading down here. And it's God doing this, God doing that, God doing this. All right, now let's go to chapter, or excuse me, we're still in chapter 1. Let's look at verse 26. And God said, are you ready for this? Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Three times God says a plural, us, our, our. God is a trinity. God is one God with three parts. Now, how a person can't understand this, I don't know. But it says that God created man in his own image, verse 27. In the image of God created he them. So let's look at a man. What is a man? Well, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23 tells us what a man is. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says that every man born in this world has three parts. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says... And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So one God with three parts, just as there's one person with three parts. God is a trinity. People say, well, trinity is not in the Bible. Yeah, the word trinity is not there, but the doctrine is. You see, we are a triune being. That means we have three parts. We are one person, but we have three parts. So when you look at me, well, all you see is my body. And I'm sorry you have to look at it. I know I'm ugly. <laughs> but when you see me, you see the body. What are, what are the three parts? Let me write them here real quick. Body, soul, and spirit. Now, the Jehovah Witnesses are the worst about this because the Jehovah Witness cult teaches that there's no trinity. And they teach that you have no soul. And that when you die, you don't go to hell. Because they believe there's no such thing as hell. 
But as you read the Bible, the Bible says the body, this is the outward part. It says inside the body is a soul, and inside of that is a spirit. Well, when you're born, you're born dead. So you're born without a spirit. The spirit's empty. When you die without Jesus Christ, the soul goes to hell. Or if you're saved, the soul goes to heaven. I don't understand how these people say, I don't believe in a trinity, when it's all throughout the Bible. But what we find is that even though we are created in God's image, we can't do what God can do. God, somehow or another, can do something that we cannot do, in that God can divide his three parts whenever he feels like it. And yet we cannot. We, our three parts, are together and cannot be separated. So when you see me, you see my body, my soul, my spirit. I can't take my body and put it over in Texas, take my soul, put it up in Alaska, and then take my spirit and put it down in, in, in Key West, Florida. I can't separate myself. The only way I'll have any separation is when I die and my soul separates from my body. As it says in Genesis, that uh, I believe it was Rebecca died. And it says, and her soul was in departing. So, I am made in the image of God with three parts, just as God has three parts. But God can do something that I can't do. What are the three parts of God over here? Let's correspond to those three. What's the body of God the Father? Jesus. What's the soul? Will that be God the Father? And then what's the spirit? I'll just abbreviate it. That's the Holy Spirit. So the three parts of God corresponds with our three parts. Just like God said, we are made in His image. But yet God takes those three parts and can separate Himself. And we can't. You say, what are you talking about? We'll go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 3.13, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. And John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, the body of God, when he was baptized, went up straight with out of the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit, capital S, of God descending like a dove, lighting upon him. So the Holy Spirit of God is descending while Jesus is down here on the earth. So the body is here, the Spirit's up there. Now look at this, verse 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Whose was the voice? The voice was God the Father. So God the Father's in heaven, the Holy Spirit's in heaven, and Jesus is down here. One God, but three different parts that somehow he can divide up. And yet we're made in the image of God in three parts, but we can't divide ourselves. So it's one God with three parts. And three is the number of divinity. Three is the number that God chose, and it's the number. Um, well, many other things that I could say about three and the number three, but it's interesting how many things in the world have to do with the number three. Like a family. You have a family, what do you have? Father, mother, children. Three parts. The sun has three parts. There's only really three main colors, blue, yellow, and red, and all the other colors can be made by mixing those colors together. There's three animal, there are three kingdoms, the animal kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, and the mineral kingdom. Matter exists only in three forms, gaseous, liquid, solid. Uh, the forces of nature are gravity, light, and electricity. And many different things all tie in with the number three. So three is a number that's quite amazing. And it, but it really ties in with the divinity and how God is the creator. Look at the atom. An atom has three parts. You know, I say this because there's a lot of people out there that say, well, I'm a Taoist. I believe in Taoism and the dualism and the two parts of everything. Uh, so sorry, you're missing something. It seems like all throughout nature, it's always three. Neutron, proton, electron. You've got to have three. Matter can't even exist without three. So that's the number three. What's the number four? Four is the number of the world, or maybe we could say of earth. And in the Bible, four is an interesting number. There's four seasons. So you have four seasons. But you also have four directions. North, south, east, and west. Four. Uh, these angels are standing up in the Bible in Revelation, and it says they're on the four corners of the what? The earth, or the world. So the number four identifies with the world or with earth. 
there are actually four elements earth wind fire and air the four elements now there were four rivers that flowed out of the garden of eden uh, four cherubims. I don't know if that has anything to do with anything, but Larkin mentions the four cherubims. So four lines up with the world, the earth. And so four has to do with that. So when you see four in the Bible, you see something quite interesting. Okay, now let's go to number five. What is the number five? Well, many Bible schools will say, well, that's the number of grace. Well, it's actually the number of death. The number five has to do with death. I don't have a problem with you making it more than one meaning, so I put grace up here as well. But the number five clearly, clearly is the number of death. Look at this with me. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 5. Now what's so neat is about when you learn these numbers, we find an interesting thing. These chapter and verse division marks in the Bible almost come alive. There are some verses in the Bible that appear to not only teach what the verse teaches, but you find some interesting things as the number applies to what's actually happening in the verse. Genesis 5.5 5 is the first verse in the Bible where it says, and someone died. Genesis 5.5, 5, 5 is the number of death, death twice. Genesis 5.5, 5, and it says, and all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Well, that's interesting. The number five is the number of death. Now, a lot of people say, well, five is also the number of grace. Grace has five letters. Jesus has five letters. Jesus is grace. Well, Jesus also died. Death has five letters. So as you're reading through the book of, of the Bible, you find out that the number five shows up a lot of times, and it has a lot of connection with dying. Five is the number of death. Well, that brings us to the next one, number six. What is six? Well, the Bible clearly tells us what this is. I wrote six up here, sorry. Um, sometimes I preach so much during the day, I do three or four videos, and my mind starts to, to go. This is the third video today, uh, just trying to get ahead. So, uh, beast. This is the number of man, or the number of the beast. Okay? So number six is clearly found in Revelation chapter 13. So let's go to Revelation chapter 13, because it tells us of a number here. And it tells us what this number is. Revelation chapter 13. I hope you're understanding where I'm coming from. Like I say, in Bible schools, you go to Bible school, they'll teach you what I'm teaching here today. They'll say, we're going to look at Bible geometrics or, or geometric, uh, Bible numeral. Uh, geometria is the word I'm looking for. Bible geom geometria. Uh, Bible numbers. And they'll tell you these same things that I'm saying up here. It's not just something that someone's pulled out of left field. It's something for years people have believed for many different reasons. Why? Well, let's look at this. Revelation chapter 13. In verse 18 it says, Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. What is the number? And his number is six hundred three score and six. So six is the number of man and of the beast. Did you know that men and beast God created on the sixth day, according to the book of Genesis? So man, his number is six. Now you want to see something interesting? Go to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 6, and you can get an idea of where I'm going with all this and, and how it applies to the scripture. 1 First, First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 6, it talks about someone who is dead while she liveth. Hmm, interesting. Dead while she's alive. First Timothy chapter 5 and verse 6 says, But she that liveth is in pleasure is dead while she liveth. Well, she, who is it talking about here? A widow, a woman who was part of a man. So when a man and a woman get married, they become one flesh. Well, she's dead, five, while she lives. Verse 6, man. So it's interesting. Five, six, dead man. <laughs> she's a dead woman. Woe man. So as you read through this, you find some interesting things, how Bible verses just so happen to correspond, sort of, with the thing that it's talking about. At least death is in the verse, dead while she liveth, and death is the number um, 5. 5, 6, chapter 5, verse 6. Many, many different things like that. Uh, it would be fun if you emailed some. Well, what do you find that, that, that shows this as well in different verses? But chapter 6 is... Uh, 
excuse me, number six is the number of man, but also the number of the beast. And, and it's interesting, in the Bible we find the number six many times. In fact, um, Nebuchadnezzar built an image, and his image was 60 by 6 by 6, which is a lot of sixes. And he was a man that he wanted all people to worship, but it was also an image that to worship was a type of the beast, the Antichrist. So many different numbers in the Bible. Now the number 7. 7 is the number of completion or perfection in the Bible. Now for some reason, that's God's favorite number, I guess. It seems like everything has to come back to the number 7 when God sets something up. In fact, uh, even to this day, they call it not lucky number 7. Why is it a lucky number? If you look through the Bible, <clears throat> you find that the number 7 is everywhere. There are seven trumpets, seven vials, seven cups, um, seven candlesticks around the mercy seat, seven feasts. Uh, Jesus Christ spoke seven words from the cross, seven different sayings. Um, I mean, I could just go into all the sevens in the Bible. There's so many different sevens. If you get a chance, go to the Cloud Church or YouTube and look up my sermon on the 7,000 years of human history. And we find out that there's really over only 7,000 years of human history. God, when he wrote the Old Testament, he shows that seven over and over and over again. Here's a chart in Larkin's book. Where he starts out, there were seven literal days of creation. Of course, there were six, and the last day God rested. Then he shows that there are seven weeks of feasts. Starting at the Feast of First Fruits and the Feast of Pentecost, you get seven weeks exactly. So there is uh, seven days, then there's seven weeks in which God does something. Take that cover off there. Then we have a week of months. As we look at the different feasts, if we start on Passover and end on Tabernacles, here we have a Feast of Weeks. So a week of days, seven days makes a week. A week of weeks, a week of months, and then a week of years. In the Bible, God commands the Jews that for six years they can plant. And on the seventh year, they're supposed to leave that to rest and let that field be vacant for a whole year and that helps bring back the nutrients and the minerals and everything we have a, a, a week of weeks of years here as well which would correspond to what uh, seven Sabbaths of years we have a week of millenniums the 7,000 years of human history that I told you about earlier so it just seems like as you read the Bible you cannot get away here he has on the bottom the seven ages or seven dispensations so you cannot get away from this number seven as you read through the Bible it's all over it why is that well for some reason that's God's number and it's made up of three plus four it's made up of God the divinity doing something in the world and what does he do he completes what he wants done so it's interesting how these numbers how these Things just seem to go together. It's, it's mathematical. It's genius. It's God, a mathematical genius, through numbers showing us different things. Now, the number eight is the number of new beginning. Something new or new beginning. I hope you're still with me. I'm just trying to get this presented, as I said, so that as I do future... Uh, videos hopefully I can reference back to this but number eight is a number of new beginnings um, on the eighth day Abraham had to circumcise his children what was that that was a sign it was a token it was to show them hey we are going to follow God we're gonna start a new beginning we were born this way but God wanted them on the eighth day to do this all these different things happen on the eighth day Noah was the eighth person from Adam. What happened? A new beginning. The flood came. So there's all these different things that happen on the number eight. The Feast of Tabernacle lasted for seven days, but on the eighth day was the Holy Convocation. What was that? That was a day where it was a new beginning to start a new cycle and I'll start something new. So you got eight, a new, new beginning, a new start. Interesting. 
Well, you've got 7,000 years of human history, like I said earlier. And then the Bible says at the beginning, of the, the end of Revelation, after the 7,000 years of human history, after the millennium, there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. Well, of course, there won't be time anymore, but if there were, that would be the start of the 8,000th year, the new beginning, the new heaven and the new earth. So you've got all these numbers that tie into different things, and it's just amazing when you look at the Bible numerics, how God has set things up to where the numbers mean something. Next, we have the number 9. Huh, Larkin doesn't have the number 9 here. 9 is the number of fruit in the Bible. If you go to, uh, well, where is it? I believe it's Galatians. There's 9 fruits of the Spirit. 9 different fruits of the Spirit. Let's go to Galatians. 9 is the number of fruit in the Bible. In uh, Galatians, I believe it's toward the end there. Um, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 20, 22. Now the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. So nine different things make the fruit of the Spirit. So nine, the number of fruit. Now there's more that I could say about that, but that's, that's a good start. And um, it's interesting to see the number nine. And like I said, as you read through your Bible, what you need to do is don't just read and, and, and skip the number in front of the verse. Read the verse and then look at the number and say, now does this number have a meaning that might go along with this verse? I had a brother in Bible school that did that. And he'd come every week to school and just say, man, I've been reading my Bible, take, paying careful attention to the numbers after he learned this. He's just like, wow, I'm finding so many cool things in the Bible and how the numbers just line up so well in so many different ways. Awesome. Awesome. Maybe you can find that as well. That's why the Bible tells us to study to show ourselves approved. You don't just read the Bible. You study it because you get stuff out of it that prove that only a divine God could have made that book in such a way that it's mathematically just awesome. Awesome. Number 10. 10 is the number of the Gentiles. 10 is the number of Gentiles. Um... It's made up of the number four and the number six. Four is the world, six is man. So man and the world taken over. Well, the history of the world, the majority of the world, has been run by the Gentiles. Except for the short period of time in which the Jews were over the earth. And one day they'll be back in the tribulation. Um, let's see, the, there's the ten horns in John's beast in the book of Revelation. What is that? That's ten kings in the tribulation that rule. What does it say? It says, until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Well, that will be fulfilled in the tribulation. We had ten, uh, well, another thing that's interesting here as well is that there are ten, how, how would I explain that? We that speak English, the majority of us, you, we use feet for measurement. So we say there's 12 inches to a foot. But most of the Gentile nations, they use the metric system. And the magic system is all tied into the number 10. So it's different. It's different. So Gentiles use the number 10. And how interesting that we today use the number 12. When we get to the number 12, you'll see why. A lot of heavy influence in Britain from Jews. So 10 is the number of the Gentiles. And there's something else I wanted to say about that, but I guess that's... Um, or 10 toes on Nebuchadnezzar's image... Uh, there were ten kingdoms, ten kings, oh, so many different tens in the Bible, it's hard to remember them all. But uh, ten, ten is the number of the Gentiles. Eleven is the number of judgment in the Bible. And I don't have time to go into that, but judgment. You can find, as you read through the Old Testament a lot of times, in verse 11, God judges so-and-so, God judges so-and-so. Number twelve is the number of Israel, or the Jews. And that's easy to figure out because there were 12 tribes of Israel. So Israel has 12 tribes. It is the product of the divine number 3 and the number 4, the world number, multiplied. There were 12 tribes of Israel, 12 stones in the high priest's blessed plate, 12 sh cakes of showbread, 12 wells of water at a limb, 12 spies were sent into Canaan. Joshua placed 12 stones on the bed of Jordan. Elijah built an altar of 12 stones. I mean, there's just 12 this, 12 that, 12 this, all through 
there were 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. Um, Jesus said, can I not send 12 angels, 12 leagues of angels, or legions of angels? Uh, he, he's, he healed a woman of 12 years old. Um, so many different 12s in the Bible. And they all seem to tie, tie in to the Jews, the Israel. Matter of fact, there's 144,000 witnesses, which is 12 times 12. Um, I think it's 12 times. Anyway, um, we were told that in the ready generation, the 12 apostles will sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So 12, without a doubt, is a clear number that ties in with the number Israel, the people of Israel. Now, 13 is the number of rebellion. I don't think Larkin adds this in either. Nope, he doesn't. He just omits it. There's a guy named Nimrod. Nimrod was the 13th from Adam. If you don't know who Nimrod is, you need to study him out. Nimrod built a kingdom called Babel, which is Babylon. Babylon started a religion called the Mystery Religion. Mystery Babylon. All idol worship comes from this area. So Nimrod was a bad, bad dude. And he was a mighty hunter before the Lord, but he also rebelled against God and started worship from falling angels and Nephilim and things like that. So 13 is a number of rebellion. Well, the only other number that I could actually put up here, I guess, would be the number 40. So I guess, where am I going to put that? I guess I'll just put it here. 40 is the number of probation. Number of probation. At the flood it rained 40 days and 40 nights. Moses was on probation 40 years in Egypt, 40 years in the desert, and 40 years with Israel in the wilderness. The spies were 40 days spying out the land, and Israel wandered 40 years in the wilderness. The reigns of Saul, David, Solomon, each lasted 40 years exactly. How strange that it was exactly 40 years. Goliath defied Israel for 40 days. Nineveh was given 40 days to repent. Elijah fasted 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus was tempted 40 days and prepared 11 times during 40 days after his resurrection. Appeared 11 times during 40 days after his resurrection. Uh, punishment was by flogging or whipping people was limited to 40 stripes save one. All these instances show that God was not hasty in his judgments, gave man ample time for a fair trial. There are other numbers mentioned in the scriptures such as 70, 120, 144, etc., but not necessary to pursue the subject further. So Larkin says, I'm going to stop there. But it is interesting, and it is uh, something that I think we should at least be familiar with. So that's why I went into this today, and hope that it's been a blessing to you. Um, so many other things that I wish I could say, but I just wanted to get that out there. I know this is a, is a short sermon, but one unity, two union, three divinity, four world, five grace or death. Six man, beast, six, six, six. Seven is completion or perfection. Eight new beginning, nine fruit. Ten Gentiles, eleven judgment. Twelve Israel, thirteen rebellion. And then forty is probation. So as we read through the Bible, we find some amazing things. And there are so many different things in the Bible that, that are indeed amazing that we can look at. So I would encourage you, as you read through the Bible, that you take a look at these numbers. Uh, pay, pay attention to some of these Bible verses when you read them. And look at the numbers and say, well, does that mean anything? A lot of times when a number is next to another number, it makes a sentence. <laughs> you know, like, uh, let me see if I can make a, a sentence for an example. Okay, just an example, like, fruit to the Gentiles is judgment. You know, I mean, sometimes there's numbers in a row like that. And sometimes they have meanings. And so whenever I see numbers, I always think, huh, geometria, what, what do those numbers mean? Do they mean anything? Do they make a sentence? But you don't want to go too deep into this. There are whole YouTube videos where people go so far into this, you tell, you're like, man, I think they need to be in the same asylum. Those people are crazy because they're going so deep into the numbers. So this is something that I don't want you to go too deep into. <clears throat> but I do want you to know what the numbers are, what they mean. And hopefully take this, because in future, when we go through the types, I'd like to preach on Bible types. I'm going to preach on uh, the 18 types of Antichrist in the Bible. 
Well, what's 18? 6 plus 6 plus 6 equals 18. Well, isn't that just coincidence that there's exactly 18 types of Antichrist in the entire Bible? Well, that's just, wow, what a coincidence, right? Or does it all tie into these numbers in such a way that the numbers actually do mean something? So that's about it. Um, I guess I'll stop there. I hope this has been a blessing to you. <laughs> um, if not, well, maybe tune back next time. But I just wanted to get this out so that when we continue our, our verse by verse, we can have this basic knowledge. When we continue our, our sermons every weekend, I can always point back to, now you remember that sermon, that real short one back then where I said this number means this. And we'll understand it all better by and by. So there it is. Uh, one lady asked me, would you get out of the way whenever you preach so I can take a picture? So if you want to take a picture of that, there it is. And uh, pray for us. We will see you back next time on the Cloud Church. And I hope this has been a instructive video. I feel like I, I could say so much more, and there's a lot more that I want to say, but I really believe that the Lord would have me get this out just so you'll have this information. So we'll see you next time, next week, and hopefully the sermon will be on Bible types. We're going to look at different types in the Bible. Not different patterns like we looked at before, but how the Bible talks about a certain guy and how that guy, the things that happened in his life, are a type of things that happened in the life of Jesus Christ. So we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.